The efficient market hypothesis is one of the most important theories ever, and it's not just academic. It has huge implications for how you should invest, and therefore how quickly you'll reach financial freedom. I'm the fireman, and I'm trying to reach financial freedom before I turn 30 years old. And I'm relying on the efficient market hypothesis not only to help me have enough money by the time I'm 30, but also to provide the returns that I would need to retire forever. But not everybody believes in the efficient market hypothesis, which is why so many people try to beat the market on their own. Unfortunately for them, most of them fail. And that's why today I'm debunking seven myths about the efficient market hypothesis. But first, just a super quick recap of what the efficient market hypothesis actually says. There are three forms of efficient markets, but the basic idea is that any asset traded on an efficient market is fairly priced. That means that trying to beat the market or earning a higher than average return isn't a viable investment strategy. The hypothesis part of the efficient market hypothesis is the idea that large stock exchanges like NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange are efficient markets. As a subscriber to the efficient market hypothesis, I personally invest in large index funds or exchange traded funds instead of trying to pick individual stocks to earn a higher than average return. Okay, so with that background, let's get into why people don't believe the efficient market hypothesis. First up, it's just poorly understood. A lot of people think that the efficient market hypothesis says that you'll earn the same return no matter which investments you pick, so stock picking makes no difference. That's definitely not the case. Risk and diversification will still play a big role in what returns you're expected to get. But two portfolios with appropriate diversification and the same risk should, over a long period of time, have about the same return. This means that it is absolutely possible to beat the market any one year, or even over a number of years. But over a really long period of time, that's extremely difficult. Second, let's talk about risk a little more. Risk is one of the most important factors in determining expected market returns. And in the stock market, it's measured with a beta score. There are a few different ways to measure beta, and that's out of scope of this video. But the basic idea is that the stock market as a whole has a beta score of 1. And that means a portfolio with a beta score of 2 should outperform the market by approximately double. That's because, all else equal, investors will obviously always prefer a less risky investment. So the only reason an investor would invest in a riskier company is if it had higher promised returns. So what this tells you is that it is absolutely possible to beat the market, just invest in riskier stocks. What is much more difficult is beating the market adjusted for risk. The efficient market hypothesis doesn't claim that every asset is just as risky as any other. What it argues is that every asset is fairly priced given the risk it has, and taking on too much risk has some very obvious downsides. So you have to decide the right balance between this risk and this reward for your own personal investment situation. But just make sure that you're keeping risk in mind. The third misconception is what I call the Buffett argument. The whole idea behind this misconception is that brilliant investors like Warren Buffett have consistently beaten the market over a long period of time. If the efficient market hypothesis is true, these people say that this wouldn't be possible. That's not exactly true. Warren Buffett did find a valuable investment strategy that hadn't been picked up by the market, and he made a killing off of it. But now that that strategy is known, his market returns haven't been nearly as stellar. So yeah, somebody might beat the market, but good luck being that person. Let's also take a second to realize that with over 100 million American investors alone, you would expect that some of them would just get lucky. There are lots of other very intelligent investors that aren't nearly as famous as Warren Buffett. So while I don't want to discredit Warren Buffett's extraordinary success in the stock market, hindsight bias can make it difficult to assess what was luck and what was genius. But I can comfortably say that at least a little bit of that was probably luck. One more point on this misconception. See, Warren Buffett doesn't invest like a regular investor. For one, he has way more knowledge and research at his disposal. But even if you had all of the same knowledge that Warren Buffett does, you still wouldn't be able to invest like Warren Buffett. And that's because he doesn't just invest in individual stocks. He buys them. That means he gets to put managers he trusts in positions of power. So he's actually adding value to these companies that he's buying. And that's something an individual investor can't do. Let's move on to the fourth misconception. The fourth misconception is that daily fluctuations in stock values disprove the efficient market hypothesis. The thinking here is that if stock market prices really were efficient, there wouldn't be such tremendous volatility. The thing is, if the market actually does reflect all publicly available information, constant adjustments are expected. 
New information will change the outlook of companies and their valuation, and the market will adjust to reflect this. With a constant stream of new information being provided throughout every day, it should be expected that these prices look pretty volatile in the short run. Speaking of timeframes, there's a big difference between short run and long run volatility. In the short run, speculation or excitement can make prices shoot up or down very dramatically. But in the long run, a lot of this activity just looks like noise. Day traders try to make a profit off of this noise. But for me, investing isn't my full-time job, and that's just too much time, energy, and guesswork for my personal investment strategy. The fifth misconception is what I call headline bias. The idea here is that if the efficient market hypothesis is true, why is there always somebody in the news whose stock market portfolio went to the moon? As far as I'm concerned, this evidence actually supports the efficient market hypothesis. The only reason these people are in the news is because they did something extremely unlikely. Everyone loves a good success story, and blind luck or crazy gambles will always pay off for just a handful of people. But it's like learning who won the lottery. Just because they did it doesn't mean that it's a repeatable strategy. The vast majority of regular investors will never be a headline. And my guess is a lot of people have lost a lot of money trying to be. Let's move on to misconception number six, which is comparing different investment types. Not every market is efficient. The best example of this, I think, is real estate. The stock market has millions of traders that are active every day, and the thousands of companies that are traded on these large exchanges are required by law to make a lot of information publicly available. Real estate isn't like that. Homes are pretty difficult to compare, and the low trading volume means that determining a fair price for a certain home in a specific neighborhood isn't always trivial. That means that in real estate, the local experts will know what a good deal is and isn't, and those that are less educated are more likely to overpay. So not every market is efficient, and intelligent investors can absolutely exploit this to get a higher than average return. That's because the efficient market hypothesis doesn't apply to every market. It only applies to efficient markets. Misconception seven isn't really a misconception. It's just that a lot of investment managers really don't want you to believe in the efficient market hypothesis. Many investment managers earn a fee for managing their clients' money, and this has created a multi-billion dollar industry. So that's a lot of incentive to keep people investing with active managers. And look, there is absolutely a use for a good financial manager in some situations. But given that most of them underperform compared to the stock market, you should just think carefully about whether you really need one for your personal situation. So I hope you found this video helpful, and if you did, hitting the like button helps spread it to more people. By the way, this video is a follow-up to last week's video, which you can find right here. In that video, I explained the efficient market hypothesis in more detail. So let me know if you have any questions in the comments. Otherwise, watch that video next. I'll see you next time.